Okay, so we've talked a lot about the innate immune response to infections, but we've mostly kind of focused on extracellular infections such as bacteria, fungi, and protozoa. Really mostly just bacteria, that's like the poster child of all this. Um, so now we're going to kind of switch gears and talk about how the innate immune response or how the innate immune system responds to viral infections. So this is just a diagram that kind of outlines all the things that we're going to talk about. A virally infected cell will become infected with itself. This could be any cell of your body, any somatic cell. Um, this is going to cause the production of interferon alpha and interferon beta, which collectively make up something called the interferon response, which is where we have resistance to viral replication in all of our cells, including the infected ones. Uh, we're going to increase expression for uh, lig uh, of the ligands for receptors on natural killer cells so that those they can come by and kill us before we can start having this stuff spreading. And we're also going to actually activate natural killer cells to come by and kill us. Uh, both of those things here. So they're going to the effector natural killer cells and then the, obviously the flags that will be holding up to kill us. So let's get into this. So all cells of our body, uh, except for red blood cells, which I don't even call, I had a prick for a general biology, well he wasn't a prick, he was actually very strict and I admire him greatly for it, but uh, whenever you took red, uh, general biology, if you said red blood cells, you got that, that question wrong, because they're not actual cells, they don't have organelles, they don't even have a nucleus, they're just a bag of hemoglobin. So if you count them as cells, but all real cells, all nucleated organelle uh, <laughs> containing cells produce type 1 interferons. And there's a lot of types of type 1 interferons. Uh, we'll talk about two that are really important, but for this, um, viral RNA. Notice that it's just RNA. So viral DNA is a little bit more difficult to sense, I guess, in terms of uh, structures of it inside of our cells. Um, and that's more or less kind of sensed by the same way that we would sense bacterial uh, DNA. But viral RNA sensors known as Rig1 and MDA5 exist in the cytoplasm. And again, we're talking about any cell here. And so the binding of this is going to lead to ultimately to uh, phosphorylation, which is kind of, you should be seeing a pattern here with this, uh, and then ultimately activation of the transcription factor known as IF3. So this is a transcription factor, TF. Uh, this is called interferon, the IF uh, is known as interferon response factor. I think, uh, some people use uh, IFR3 as, as a, but that, anyways, <laughs> transcription factor that ultimately it leads to the production of interferon beta, which is going to have both autocrine and paracrine effects, um, which is do, does all the things we talked about. We're basically just making life more difficult for that virus, uh, and then ultimately stimulating the production of interferon alpha. Okay, so let's look at some pictures. So I didn't have a lot of room to fit this on the last slide, so I just for some reason squeezed it down. But so we have here a virus that's coming into our cells. Um, we see we see IRF. That's what we talked about here. I should also go ahead and just include that this is identified by the Rig one and the MDA five. That kind of for some reason is not included in this diagram. But anyways, this undergoes a series of events that's going to cause transcription of interferon beta. Notice two other uh, transcription factors that are involved in this, NF-kappa-B. It seems like any time there's phosphorylation inside the cell, we have NF-kappa-B in this context, and then AP1. But at the, the, the end of the story, we have interferon beta being uh, transcribed and then translated. And so this is going to have both paracrine effects to it. It's going to bind to the type 1 in, uh, re interferon receptors of other cells, but it's also going to bind to the interferon receptors of our own cells. This is also going to cause a signal transduction pathway. This is going to cause transcription and translation of interferon alpha. The transcription factor for interferon alpha, if you're just curious, is this IRF7 here. Um, that's not really important so much as the fact that we're producing a lot of interferon beta and a lot of interferon alpha all on our own. We don't, they, they're, they're kind of starting this thing going. It could be any cell in your body. It could be your epithelial cells if they want it to be. So yes, every cell in the body does make uh, type 1 interferon, but plasmacytodendritic cells are factories for making large quantities of interferons. They make about a thousand times more interferon than say an epithelial cell or a skin cell. And if you, they're very, very 
like freaks of nature almost. Uh, they're part uh, lymphocytes, part dendritic cells, and this picture here, you can see just this whole thing. It's just a giant endomembrane system. This like the cell was just designed for one sole purpose, and that's producing uh, type one interferons. So, so we didn't talk about another type, but there is a type known as type two, which I'm just going to go ahead and put over here. Hopefully, you can see that type two. Um, it's not superbly important, but I'll just tell you. Uh, right now that it's made by uh, natural killer cells and what it does is it's going to activate macrophages. So the ones that we did talk about that are important are type, well type 2 is important too, but type 1 um, so there's there's the immediate effects of it, there's the delayed effects of it, and then there's the actual production of it. So, so um, for the production thing uh, all cells make this all cells can produce, um, let, me, let me get some colors in here, so that all cells are involved in the production of it, but plasmacytoid dendritic cells, otherwise known as PCD, they make about a thousand times more of type 1 interferon than uh, regular host cells do. So for activation, the two proteins that are in all of your cells that are involved in this are known as Rig1. and MDA5. These are going to bind to the viral RNA um, in the cytoplasm. This binding here is going to trigger a conformational change for both the Rig and MDA5, but this conformational change is going to cause, um, it's going to guess, carry all the way down to a card domain, and then once it's in the card domain, this is going to uh, actually go and activate something known as mitochondrial antiviral signaling peptide. The MAVS is the acronym for it and I like it because it actually <laughs> fills out. We call it MAVS for short so that's anti mitochondrial antiviral signal peptide. And uh, what this is going to do, um, this is going to lead to the formation of a dimer, the dimerization for RIG. I don't know why it doesn't form the dimerization of MDA5 uh, structurally. The book doesn't go in a lot of detail on uh, what these guys compose of other than the fact that they have a car domain and an alpha helix. <clears throat> but anyways, this dimerization is going to lead to the phosphorylation of other signal molecules or other signal peptides, I guess it could be more specific here. This is going to lead ultimately to the activation of the transcription factor known as IRF3 or interferon response factor 3. And this is going to lead to the uh, translation of interferon beta Remember that from the diagram here. So interferon beta has both autocrine and paracrine effects. So for the autocrine effects, that's where it's going to basically act on the, it's the, uh, the own cell. It acts on the cell that it came from. Auto means self. Paracrine, it's just going to act on others. If you've taken endocrinology or remember that chapter of the anatomy and physiology, you know what that is. So both of these things combine. The, both the autocrine, though, and the paracrine are going to take a role in something known as the interferon response. And what the interferon response uh, is going to result in is the... Um, I mean, I guess I could include the activation of the transcription, transcription factor, IRF7, which leads to translation of interferon alpha. Okay, so let's just talk about what the interferon response also entails. in. So I said for type 1 interferon that there are effects. And the two types of effects that I'm going to talk about in this, which are the interferon response itself, would be the intermediate effects, uh, the intermediate effects, sorry, and then the delayed effects. For the immediate effects, there's two. Um, this is going to result in things that are going to interfere with viral replication and then warning other cells nearby of to start producing more interferon on their own.
kind of running out of room, so I'm going to go ahead and color coordinate these um, with what each and every one of them does. So for the ones that block viral replication, um, two of these that I'm going to list, um, just as examples, would be things such as viral endonucleases. And uh, I don't know if you remember this, but PKR. I think for my microbiology videos, I talked about PKR. I read about this in David Goodsell's book, The Machinery of Life. For some reason, it stuck with me. It's known as protein kinase RNA activated. And all that this is is a kinase enzyme that's going to block the elongation factors. Uh, and so by extension, it's going to stop translation from happening. This is going to kill the cell itself, which is kind of... A uh, tad bit excessive, but you know you, you gotta you gotta stop it from happening. For the warning of other cells, this is all part of the interferon response. So what I was meant to say was, uh, I guess, for the interferon response, is it does include this. Um, it also includes the warning of neighboring cells, and it also um, plays a lesser role in the delayed effects. But if you have a lot of interferon type one being produced, you're going to have delayed effects as well. So the delayed effects, I'm going to do those in blue as well. I know I'm getting really cramped here with this concept map here. But the delayed effects are going to be the way that it's going to act on natural killer cells. I'm just going to abbreviate that as NK. And it's going to cause them to divide. See how I drew that? They're going to start proliferating, reproducing, dividing over and over again. Um, and the other thing they're going to do is they're going to mature into their cytotoxic effector state. So I'm just going to say mature. That's a delay effect of type 1 interferons. The other things that it's going to do is it's going to increase the gene expression of basically signals it's going to that are going to say that the natural killer should should kill them because remember the whole killing decision is a very dynamic process. So I'm going to say that he's going to expose himself the infected cell will expose himself to the natural killer cells. I know, it's getting really, really crowded. The other last thing I'm going to mention um, is it's going to also mostly macrophages. Alright, so that's interferon, type 2 and type 1.